So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Clee from GE. And as a member of the CEF Leadership Council, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you back here after this morning's very thoughtful um, and open town hall meeting and, and the breakout sessions that we had this morning. I don't know how MR and PJ do, that, do it, but every year the conversation um, seems to get better and better. Really great ideas, opportunities to learn from each other. And I know we come away from it with action items and things that we want to follow up on based on the, the great conversations that we have, both in the sessions, but, but even more importantly, in the informal networking that goes on um, over the course of this meeting. I was particularly struck yesterday by a comment that Lisa Jackson made about needing to really focus on the activities where we can move the needle. And for every company here, it's probably going to be a, a different set of activities. And for us at GE, I think about where we can have the biggest impact. And certainly, it's on reducing our own footprint. But really, it's in the investment in R&D that we've been making. And for those of you who were in the breakout session in Big Data, you heard Deb Frodel talk about how we've invested $15 billion to date and will invest another $10 billion over the next five years in the products that help our customers be more fuel efficient, more energy efficient, and dramatically reduce their environmental footprint. It's our contribution to sustainability where we really can help move the needle. So focusing on R&D, on the products, on using the industrial internet, and then working with our supply chain. When I think about how GE can impact sustainability for the future, those are our focus areas. That's where we move the needle. But let me get to, where, to why I'm really up here today, which is to introduce the speaker who's going to kick off this afternoon, and that's David Steiner, who's going to share with us, um, I think, his inspiring remarks from his experience um, at Waste Management. So Dave has been the CEO of Waste Management for the last 11 years. Um, and I think he has a great story about how he chose Waste Management over a, another company um, that hasn't been quite as successful. And I'll let him share that with you. Um, but he's, he came out of private practice as a lawyer, joined the company in 2000 as vice president and deputy general counsel. Within less than a year, he was promoted to general counsel and senior um, vice president and corporate secretary. And then in 2003, became CFO of the company. And a year after that, was elevated to CEO. So it's my great honor to welcome Dave to the stage and look forward to, to learning from waste management's experiences. Jump up here. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, I always say I am the living, walking embodiment of better lucky than good, because I went to waste management as deputy general counsel, three and a half year, years later, became CEO. And the company that I told no, that I said, I'm going to go to waste management, and they said, why would you do that when you could come here? Why would you go to that company when we're one of the top 10 companies in the world, five most innovative companies in the world? That company was Enron. And, um, <laughs> and Enron, as we all know, was bankrupt a year later. So uh, I tell everybody, I am the living, walking embodiment of better lucky than good. And, and you notice I've got this, this big package here. I've got um, my optometrist is my brother. And uh, my older brother, he works right over the hill here, so I'm going to go to lunch with him right after here. That's why I'm not eating lunch here. Um, when I turned 50, my brother said, you know, if you don't use reading glasses now, you'll, you'll never really need reading glasses. Once you hit 50, it, it's pretty much set, and you won't need reading glasses. I now travel with two different sizes of speech, one big and one real big so that I don't have to wear glasses when I read, so I'm going to make him pay for lunch this afternoon. I, I want my money back. He gave me some bad advice. Um, the other thing, I, I, before I get started, is um, what a spectacular place, Half Moon Bay. I mean, it's, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. And we're flying out here today from Houston, and I thought, you know, there is nothing that Half Moon Bay has, that, that Houston has, that Half Moon Bay would want to have, except for one thing. Rain. Um, we've been getting a little bit too much rain in Houston. I know a lot of you have friends and colleagues um, down in Houston. Uh, obviously, our hearts and thoughts go out to, to those that are affected by the flooding. There's another storm coming in today. We're, we're lucky to make it out ourselves this morning. Um, I know our hearts and thoughts all go out to the folks down in Houston who, who, are, going through, um, who are going through those horrible floods. And so I mentioned my brother lives right over the hill. I was actually uh, born in the Bay Area. My dad went to Stanford, and, and so you know, I've become very familiar with the area. I moved out of here about 45 years ago. But, but being here, 
and having that buzz about the Silicon Valley, it sort of made me think about what is it that drives the Silicon Valley? You know, virtually every company in the 45 years since I left the Bay Area, every company that was built in the Bay Area and in the Silicon Valley that succeeded really was driven by two things, innovation and adaptability. And they needed both innovation and adaptability, because if you only have one, you don't succeed. You know, many companies started in the last, 40, last 45 years that innovated, right? How many of you, I'm looking for the people that are my age in the audience, how, how many of you remember Wang computers and Apollo computers, right? How about Netscape and Lycos and Pets.com, right? All companies that innovated, but they didn't adapt when the world changed around them. They didn't adapt to the changing customer needs and to societal norms. And as a result, they disappeared. They disappeared to be overtaken by those companies that did innovate and did adapt. You may think that you know, innovation and adaptability, yeah, that applies in the Silicon Valley, but does it really apply to waste management? Well, for us, it does. Innovation and adaptability are very pivotal to our future growth, just like they are to tech companies like Apple or, or Google. Now, the cycles in the waste industry don't move as fast as they do in the tech industry, right? I like to say we're not, we're not developing waste management 6.0. We're still working on waste management 1.0. Um, so we don't have cycles that move as fast, but we need to innovate to stay ahead of our competition. And we always have to adapt to our customers' needs, to societal norms, and to changing trends. So we have to innovate. But you know, sometimes when you look at the Silicon Valley, when you look at other companies, and when you look at waste management, sometimes when you innovate, you're a little bit ahead of the game. Sometimes you innovate a little bit too early. You know, I always look back at history as a precursor to what's going to happen in the future. And when you look back in history, in the early 1900s, one of the very first patents that was issued with respect to horseless carriages, one of the very first patents was the electric car. But at that time, there was a lot more oil in the United States than there was electricity. So the combustion engine won out because it was more economic than electricity to drive the horseless carriage. In other words, market factors favored oil over electricity. It was another 100 years or so before electricity became a viable option. Why? Because in that 100-year period, electricity both became more economical, but maybe more important, the change in societal norms led to favoring cars that were non-fossil fuel based. And now we see the electric car becoming a part of society. So let's take a look at waste management through these two lenses, innovation and adaptability. And more specifically, what I wanted to do today was talk about how innovation and adaptability apply to our push for a zero waste society and what effect that's having on recycling today. You know, relative to our norms, societal norms changed in the 1990s such that our customers wanted to find non-landfill solutions. Our customers asked us to help them recycle more. And we adapted to their wants and desires by shifting our investment away from landfills and toward recycling assets. By the early 2000s, recycling rates had more than doubled. And so we began to innovate to take recycling to the next level. First, we looked at ways to make it easier for customers to recycle. Remember, for those of you that are my age, remember when we used to have to have all those different bins in our house? We had one bin for paper and one bin for plastic and one bin for bottles. Um, it was a little bit hard to do that. You had to put out three separate bins. You had to remember what went into what. And so we did something that we called single stream recycling. Single stream recycling allows customers to create one single stream of recyclables. They take all of their recyclables and they put them into one bin. They take their paper, their plastic, their bottles, everything they can, they put it into one bin, and then we use technology at our recycling plants to separate those materials. We use fast moving screens, magnets, electric currents, optical sorters, blowers. We use a lot of different technology to separate their paper from the plastics, from the cans, from the, from the ferrous metals, from the non-ferrous metals. And then at the end, we bale the material and we sell it. And everyone was happy. Recycling rates went up. In fact, 
In places where we put in single stream recycling, we saw rates go up as much as 15 to 20 percent. We saw, we saw rates double in a lot of markets where we put in single stream recycling. And the buyers of the material were thrilled because they got recyclable materials that were actually cheaper than using virgin materials so they could help the environment while helping their bottom line. And we were happy because high commodity prices led to profits from our recycling line of business. So we did what any company would do when they find a technology that drives profitability. We invested further into our recycling assets and we innovated further. The recycling rates had gone from single digits to about 35%, but we said, you know, we can do more. 35% is nice, but how do we get to 100%? How can we get to 100% of the material that we bring in gets recycled? You know, it sort of seemed odd to me that we take this material that you all give us every day. You hand it to our trucks, and we take it, and we put it in the landfill, and we bury it. Well, that's, that commodity has value. And we did a study, and we found that everything that we put into our landfills, if we could separate that and sell it, it had about 12, 13 billion dollars of value. You know, we're a 14 billion dollar company. We could double our revenue if we took the material that you give us and call garbage. If we could separate it and sell it, we could then create a whole new revenue stream. And we really thought we could get that going. So we looked at the different areas where we were putting things into our landfills, the biggest being organics. Organics makes up about 30% of the waste stream. If we could just recycle organics, we could take that 35% recycling rate and get it closer to 70%. And then if we could find something to do with electronics and all the other materials that are currently being buried, we could get it up to 80% in a push toward 100% of the material that we generate being reused. So we innovated by investing in technologies that took the waste that you create and turn it into energy, turn it into specialty chemicals, turn it in plastic bottles cases back into oil. We have the technologies. We had the technologies and we currently today have the technologies that work. That's the good news. The bad news, like that electric car that somebody invented a hundred years ago, we were a little bit ahead of the game. Our technology worked, but it wasn't the most economical way to dispose of those materials. But we continued to invest in those technologies because in 2007 and 2008, we had the same opinion of the world that I think every company in the world had. What's that? Well, first, that oil and other energy prices were going to continue to go up and up and up. Remember 2007, $200 oil, right? And in 2007, if you didn't believe in $200 oil, you got laughed off the stage, right? You're, you're, you're plan if you're not planning for $150 to $200 oil, you better get a new business plan. But we didn't need $200 oil to make money taking your materials and turning them into other, into other things like energy and oil. We only needed about, only needed, <laughs> and today it seems quaint, we only needed about $130 to $150 oil. In 2007, that seemed like a given, right? $130 oil, we had that in 2007. So we continued to invest in alternative green technologies. What else in 2007? The BRIC countries. Everybody remember the BRIC countries? The theory in 2007 was that the BRIC countries are gonna grow so fast that they're gonna eat up every piece of virgin material in the whole world. And so they're gonna grow and grow and grow and they're gonna eat up virgin material so they're gonna have to have recycled material to meet their demand for commodities. And that demand is going to go up and up and up because their economies are going to go up and up and up. And so um, we all know what happened there, right? What happened to the brick companies, countries? Well, they lived up to their names. They sort of fell like a brick. And we know where that ended up with materials. And so now we're faced with a different type of scenario. You know, in, in 2007, when you've got oil at $200, you've got the BRIC countries eating everything up, what do you do? You invest. And we did just that. We invested over a billion dollars in new green technologies and recycling assets, and we saw the signs of success until we all know what happened, right? The fracking revolution drives oil down to $60. The BRIC countries' economies stopped growing. So commodity prices from cardboard to copper, from plastics to paper, they dropped due to a lower demand from the BRIC country. So our investments all of a sudden weren't succeeding. And as a CEO, what do you do when your investments aren't succeeding? You don't invest as much. And you better adapt to the reality of the new situation or risk dying. And as a for-profit company, 
We have to do that. But it's not just waste management that needs to adapt or die. It's green technologies and it's recycling overall in the United States and throughout the world. Remember that trend I mentioned that we had 35% recycling rates and we were gonna move towards 70%? Well, that trend in the last three years has screeched to a grinding halt. The recycling rates have stagnated. There's a lot of reasons for that. There's the economy, there's lightweight packaging, there's a lot of different reasons. But nonetheless, recycling rates peaked out at 35% and have stagnated or gone backwards in the last two years. And it's not because fewer people want to recycle. You all in the room know, just like I do, people want to recycle more. It is not a lack of wanting to recycle that is driving the recycling rates down. So why are we seeing the rates stagnate? Well, one reason is that smaller recyclers throughout the United States and the world are starting to go out of business. And large recyclers like waste management, we're starting to close down unprofitable plants and we're not investing in new plants. You see, a recycling plant is just like a manufacturing plant, right? You have a product, you run through processing costs, and then you have what can you sell it for on the back end. You know, to use the analogy of an automobile plant, if you have an automobile plant that manufactures a, a, an automobile, the processing cost, if you will, of making that automobile, if it costs $20,000 to process raw materials into an automobile and they can sell it for $25,000, they make money, pretty simple. And that formula always worked in recycling. We spend money to process the materials that you give us, we bundle the material, and we sell the finished product. But under the adage of no good deed goes unpunished, because we made it easier to recycle, consumers actually recycled more, exactly what we wanted to do. But they figured, you know, if we can recycle more, maybe even more is better. So they started to put more things into the bin, when in doubt, they put the material into the bin. And that led to people putting things that weren't recyclable into their bins. So we have a lot more contamination in our recycling stream than we've ever had in the past, which is stressing our systems and increasing our processing costs. You know, another thing that has driven, um, has driven our processing cost up is the, another great innovation, lightweight packaging, right? Lightweight packaging is wonderful. The consumers love it, and it should be recyclable, but believe it or not, lightweight packaging isn't recyclable. So we get a lot of these non-recyclable materials. And as there's more and more being put into the stream of commerce, we're getting more and more of these materials that we can't recycle. So recycling's become more confusing to consumers, and with best intentions, they put more non-recyclable materials into their recycling carts. So this all drives our processing costs way up. In some cities, we're getting garbage in our recycling materials. We're getting about 30 to 40% garbage in those recycling materials. What does that do? It drives our processing costs up by 30 to 40%. So, so we need to make sure that we can adapt, right? We need to make sure that we can adapt our systems to understand the new types of commodities that our, that our customers are creating and learn how to put them to their best use. You know, another great innovation, flexible packaging. You know, those pouches, they're used for just about everything. You know, when, when I had my kids were young, you'd give them the juice in those little flexible packages. Um, they're great for consumers. They're great for branding. You can get more food into them. They're designed for all sorts of different products. They've basically replaced glass jars in the baby food aisle. They've replaced paper boxes in the food aisle. They've got tuna fish in them. They've got nuts in them. And uh, for those of you that are going up to Napa, you can even buy wine in those packages. I, I don't recommend you drink that wine, but, uh, <laughs> but you can buy that wine in that flexible package. They're lightweight, they're energy efficient, and they're convenient. They're just about perfect other than the fact that they cannot be recycled. And that presents a big conundrum to us. You know, we want to help decrease waste, we want to recycle more. We want to get to that zero waste world, but if you can't recycle flexible packaging and it's becoming a bigger and bigger piece of what the consumer wants, what are we gonna do with that material? So what does this all mean for recycling in the United States? Well we've got to understand how we can merge the convenience of flexible packaging, the convenience of single stream recycling, and address those high contamination levels and make it work for waste management. You know, when you think about it, 
the way society has changed, we're all eating more things out of plastic containers. It started with the water bottle a long time ago, but now um, you've got much more things that are built into plastic, ready to eat meals, a lot of different things. And, and what does that do to our recycling process? Well, a lot of times they're in a shape that we can't recycle them. A lot of times they're made out of material that isn't recyclable. So the impact of more smaller single service items in our stream of commerce has one effect on us. It increases our cost to process the materials. Plastic is great. Plastic is very convenient. But when they end up in the recycling stream, they don't become convenient. They become expensive. So higher processing costs. That's the one story to tell, that the changing stream and the lower demand has led to a big, higher processing cost for us. But that didn't really bother us five years ago because there was so much demand coming from China that we were able to sell it. Going back to the example of Ford, if it cost me $20,000 to process the automobile and I can sell it for 25, I make money. If my processing costs go up to 23, but what I can sell it for goes up to 27, I'm okay with my processing costs go up. But now you can see sort of where the story goes, right? When the BRIC country started to fail and, and, and China's economy slowed down, demand for commodities began to fall. And we started to see a reduction in commodity prices. What I talked about with Ford works just in reverse. If your processing costs go from 20 to 25,000 and what you can sell it for goes from 25 to 20, that's not a successful business model. And we found that in recycling, we actually started to lose money in recycling in most quarters. Some quarters we made money, but it wasn't really covering our cost of capital. So what do you do when you're investing in things that don't cover your cost of capital or that lead to losses? What do you do? I don't have to ask that question. I don't need to, I don't need to pick on someone in the audience to ask. What do you do? You stop investing. So we were investing two to $300 million a year in recycling assets, and that number went to virtually zero. In fact, it went to below zero because we actually had to start shutting down some of our recycling plants that were losing a million to two million dollars a month. And believe me, we are not leading that parade. We are following that parade. This is happening throughout the world and you're starting to read about it a little bit in the financial press where there are recycling facilities all the way from England to the United States, throughout Europe and South America that are shutting down. And Green conversion technologies, here we are where, where I spent a lot of time in 2007 and 2008 investing in new green technologies, $60 oil. It's virtually ceased the big high scale investment in green technology. So those diversion rates that we're trying to get to, that 100% diversion rates, that's not something that's going to happen under the current system. And that's not something that we should be happy with. We shouldn't be happy with it. Our customers shouldn't be happy with it. Our governments clearly aren't happy with it. And certainly, the planet isn't happy with it. So what do we do to move diversion rates in the right direction? Well, it starts with asking a key question, right? What's our goal? If our goal is to recycle 100% of the material that we create, we're gonna take a certain set of actions. If our goal is to, is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we might say, look, let's create more flexible packaging because that does reduce greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions. But you can't recycle that material. So we've got a trade off there, right? We need to understand what is it the goal that we want to accomplish. And if the goal is to recycle everything, we got a lot of work to do, I can tell you that. But we gotta do it by changing the business model, by looking at things like glass, that today just doesn't have a value in the recycled stream. You can't recycle glass and it's not being recycled, it's being piled up throughout the United States. So what are we gonna do with that? Do we wanna say, if we wanna to get to 100% diversion, we've got to recycle glass. But if there's no one that will take that glass to recycle it, are we really doing the right thing by having glass in our current recycling system? We've got to improve the quality of the recyclables that we collect and that's about us and our government's doing a better job of educating our customers on how to recycle right and educating our customers as to what materials can and what materials can't be recycled. And we need to set realistic goals. You know, we need to understand what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So for example, a couple programs around the country said, you know, we've got these shopping bags. Everybody has the shopping bag issue, right? Uh, not in California, because now we've banned uh, the shopping bags in California, but everybody has the shopping bags. 
Um, and by the way, the, the producers of the bags, the, the grocery stores, the Walmarts, they don't like the problem. So they came to us and they said, let's recycle these things. These things are very recyclable. They're made out of a material that's great, that can be recycled. So let's, um, let's go and recycle these bags. A great idea and a noble effort. So we said, great, we'll, we'll run them through our current system. We ran them through our current system. What did they do? They got wrapped around every axle that we had in our system and it shut the plant down. We couldn't recycle the bag. So we've got to work with our partners along the value chain from the product manufacturers to the end users to ensure that we're all thinking as a part of a single interrelated system to ensure that the environmental model works. The role of recycling in the broader context of the circular economy where everything has value is certainly one that we all know has gained traction, but it requires a different way, a different way to approach the business. To this end, we need to develop a life cycle, a sort of a life cycle thinking approach where we evaluate each material to determine its optimal value throughout its life and not just the value at the end of its life. And this requires us all to challenge our current thinking of supply chains and, and input and values. It requires us all to rethink our linear business models and instead think about a circular business model, creating shared value throughout that circular value chain. And we need to make the solution lasting. Because if it's just a temporary fix and recycling and under the version technologies can, sit, can continue to see all this volatility that we've seen in the last three years, no one's going to invest long-term capital. So we need to innovate and adapt the same way the great technology companies, I know we've got Apple in the room, probably the greatest reinvention of technology and the greatest reinvention of a business model in the history of corporate America. Uh, we've got to do the same thing in recycling. We can get recycling rates back moving in the right direction. We can get recycling rates moving toward that 100% diversion, but we need to act to fix the broken system. The longer we wait, the more we're going to see recycling facilities shut down around the world. And once they shut down, it's going to be real hard to rebuild that infrastructure. And we at Waste Management absolutely recognize that we've got to take the lead if we're going to actually change the system. We're the biggest link in the chain. We've got to be the leader, but we can't do it alone. We want to work with our customers. We want to work with our governments. We want to work with the NGOs. We want to work with others to understand their needs so that we can find a solution that's good for our business, good for our, gov our governments, good for our customers, and most importantly, good for our planet. Thank you all. And